Thank you. You may be seated. We continue our study in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 13 this evening. The message entitled, John Fulfilled His Course. Acts chapter 13, verses 24 through 25. You recall that last time together, last week, we looked at David and Saul, ancestry lost and found, and saw a very interesting pattern of 40 years in Scripture. 40 years in Scripture. We saw that as... Paul is beginning his message here. He's first talked about the Exodus, and then he's moved into the transition between the different types of government. He's talked about the book of Judges, which was a theocracy, all the way down to the time when the kings began to rule, when they rejected Samuel, the last judge, and they said, we no longer want to have you and your sons ruling over us. We want you to anoint a king for us. And that rejection of man, when God puts a man in authority is actually a rejection of God and God made that very clear in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8 verses 9 through 13 and so we had the opportunity of looking at various 40-year marks in the history of Israel and sort of comparing that to 40-year marks here in the United States we saw that 40 days or 40 years whenever that number 40 is used in scripture is a time of testing, a time of judgment, and a time of law. Sometimes people pass the test, and frequently they fail the test when God gives them the test. We looked at many different illustrations of that, all the way from the children of Israel eating manna 40 years in the wilderness, which is a positive way that God provided for them, in spite of the fact that they were rebellious to the references that talked about their wandering in the wilderness 40 years. The reason for it, that 40 days they had been spying out the land, and so since God says you rejected the report of the spies, I'm going to give you 40 days each day for a year. You shall bear your iniquities even 40 years, Numbers 14, 34. We find that God used it as a test for Israel during that time. The Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, and to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. God gives tests in 40s. Many of us have gone through tests in school. Many of us have gone through tests in life. It's interesting when God gives a test, he gives you 40 years to prepare for it. <laughs> when we were in Israel, my wife and I, we took a course at the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Our regular courses were all taught over at the American Institute of Holy Land Studies, but we were required as master's students to take courses over at the Hebrew University, taught in Hebrew at the college level, and um, we had to be able to pass not a whole bunch of quizzes, not a bunch of intermediate tests, not other things. The way they run it in Israel is you study for a whole year. You listen to lectures for a whole year. At the end of that year, you have a week of dead time, and then you take a final exam. And that is your grade for the course. Interesting. I'm glad we didn't have to do that for 40 years. <laughs> We'd have just completed it last year if that were the case. But um, 40 years of testing. We saw that some of the kings, such as David, who is mentioned here in this list that the Apostle Paul is giving in his sermon, David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. First Kings, all the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. We find that during that period of time, God gave some tests, one of which David failed, and it says, after it came to pass, after 40 years, Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow. You remember, Absalom was the one who led the rebellion against David. Sometimes we don't see the results of the test that God gives to us until a great deal of time has gone past and sometimes we think ah oh, I must have gotten away with it there are no results to that problem of whenever long ago God does not forget and God does remind us at various points in our life of things that he does not want us to do again ever 
We saw there was a future prophecy concerning Egypt that dealt with 40 years. God is going to make the land of Egypt desolate and waste where no foot of man shall pass through it, nor a foot of beast through it, neither shall it be inhabited for 40 years. And then after 40 years, God is going to bring it back. That's Ezekiel chapter 29. We saw that the time of 40 years was indelibly burned into the conscience of Israel as the maximum time that God would tolerate sin before sending judgment and the maximum time that he would give them to pass their test. Sometimes we saw the time of testing ends in victory, not merely defeat. The Philistines had challenged Israel for 40 days, and on the 40th day, David stood up and said, I will fight this uncircumcised Philistine, and God gave victory. We find Elijah did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights, and to Horeb, the mount of God, there's victory. We find that Jonah preached for 40 days that Nineveh would be overthrown, and they repented and were not overthrown. We find Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he was unhungered, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him, but he had victory. The test does not mean failure. The test means, are you ready for victory? Are you prepared? When the test finally comes to you to an end, have you passed it or have you failed it? That brings us tonight to John fulfilled his course. Verses 24 and 25, when John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Paul has just told them in verse 23 that all of that promise up to David pointed to Jesus. So he mentions Jesus first. But then he backs off and says, let me give you a little more focus. Let's talk first about John. Did you notice there are seven key events in this text that Paul used to bring his Jewish hearers to the point of Christ. Number one, and these are very important because we're going to see them paralleled in just a second. Seven specific key events that Paul used to bring his Jewish hearers to Christ. Number one, he started with the Exodus. What is the Exodus? The Exodus is the formation of Israel, not merely as a people group, but it is the formation of Israel into a nation. They were already a genetically bonded people group. But they were not yet a nation. When they came down into Egypt, it was a family, a big family to be sure, but it was a family. And as they grew in Egypt, they were not a distinct nation, though they were a distinct people group. But with the Exodus, when God brought them out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and established his covenant with them at Mount Sinai, he made them into a nation. The second key event that Paul has mentioned in his sermon preceding this, he has reminded them of the trial, testing, and law. That was what we were talking about last week with those 40 days and 40 years, and the number 40 in the Old Testament, which occurs over and over and over again, and you always see it in one of those three contexts. That is trial, testing, law. A test that they had at first failed, but ultimately passed when they went into the land. Then he reminded them, third of all, of victory, the giving of a land. Victory, the giving of a land. Number four, he reminded them of their inheritance, how he divided the land to them by lot. Number five, he reminded them of divine rule, that's the book of Judges, that degenerated into human rule, the monarchy where Saul was chosen by the people, popular election. What a degeneration from God choosing the leaders and ruling his people directly through his judges to the people saying we want to be like the nations around us. We choose our own leader, 
We don't care about his spiritual qualifications. We only care about whether or not we'll be like everybody else. And we want a king who will go out and lead us in war. Had God led them through the wilderness and defeated all their enemies in the wilderness? Yes. Had God led them as they crossed the Jordan River? Well, even before that, the kingdoms of Og and Bashan. God had led them there. Had he given them victory? Was he their king? When they crossed the river, had God led them? Had they defeated their enemies? Had they taken the cities? But they didn't like God as their king. That degenerated into human rule, popularly chosen monarchy. The sixth thing we saw was he focused on the first king chosen by God. As Paul is preaching to them, he picks David out very specifically. Saul was chosen by the people. David was chosen by God. And so in that context, he gave a restatement of the promise to Abraham. And then he jumped, number seven, directly from David to Jesus, the covenant fulfilled. From David to Jesus, he passes over all the rest of the Old Testament. David to Jesus, covenant fulfilled. And then, as we just noted, he backs up to give a closer focus on the announcement of Jesus by John. Verse 24, when John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. I'd like you to notice several things out of that very short verse. As Paul preaches the message, he is about 40 years out from the birth of John the Baptist. Rather interesting. Look at how his reference to John parallels the seven points that he made in rehearsing the specifically chosen events in the history of Israel. Number one, what was John's message? It was a message about a baptism for repentance. In other words, turn around from the way you're going. It was a time of testing, judgment, and law. And now you need to repent. You need to turn around from what you have been doing before. Secondly, the message is for a clear outward show of repentance. In this case, baptism. Now, you know people that baptism does not save, but it's an outward symbol of an inward spiritual reality. Number three, who is the message to? The message was to Israel, just like the seven specific events that Paul mentioned in the history of Israel. It was a message to Israel and Paul's preaching to Jews. Number four, and I think this is fascinating because it parallels number four in that first list. John called for an exodus. The people came out to him in the wilderness away from the apostate religion that had formed, but had lost contact with the living God. Number five, John's call was at the end of a time of trial, testing, and law. The nation of Israel is about to be destroyed. 70 AD, approximately 40 years after the death of Christ. Jerusalem is surrounded by the Romans and the Roman general Titus levels the city and burns the temple and as Jesus had prophesied throws everything into the Tyropean Valley. You know there's a lot of very interesting things going on here as these people are there are people seeped in the things that you've heard last week and this week. It was the end of a time of trial, testing and law. They would either fail or pass the test by rejecting or accepting the Messiah to whom John pointed. Next, for faith there would be victory, just as Israel experienced victory after crossing the Jordan River in the days of Joshua. But for doubt there would be defeat. Next, for faith, there would be an inheritance greater than the real estate. For doubt, as happened in 70 AD, there would be the loss of the land that was their inheritance. 
Next, they would go back to divine, would they go back to divine rule, that is, back to a theocracy, with Christ as the king of their life, or would they still have human rule as the supreme law of their lives? Then, would they remember the promises to David and the reinstatement of the Abrahamic covenant, which also provided a future salvation for Gentiles? Or would they remain buried in rabbinic Judaism? And finally, would they understand that John was preaching the fulfillment of the promises in Jesus? Or they would reject the testimony of John and remain in spiritual darkness? There's a lot packed into that. As you look at the life of John, what he did, what he said, how he pointed to Christ, as you look at all the Old Testament pictures that Paul brings up in his sermon, that would bring back these floods of hours of teaching in the Old Testament to his hearers. These are very significant issues that Paul raises in their minds by focusing on John the Baptist as the forerunner of Christ. The fact that Paul mentions John and his message without further comment implies that his audience already knew something about John. Some kind of word must have reached their synagogue prior to Paul coming concerning John the Baptist in some time past. And Paul reminded them that John pointed to someone else besides himself. Verse 25, And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. That should remind us of three things. That... One short verse there. First of all, it should be a reminder to us that our responsibility, no matter how great or how small we are, our responsibility is always to point to Christ. That's what John did. Secondly, it should remind us of the greatness of Jesus and the utter insignificance of ourselves. Did you see that phrase? Whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. I am not even good enough to untie his shoes, much less to put them on or take them off. And thirdly, it should be a reminder to correct other people's concepts, their wrong concepts, of any importance that they might attach to us. Did you see that phrase? Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. Very good lessons to learn out of that, don't you think? But you know, the phrase that's of interest to us tonight is, John fulfilled his course. John fulfilled his course. You know, I used to be a runner. You've heard me talk about that on occasion. I ran cross country. I ran multiple different kinds of races in track. In track, my usual races were the half mile, the mile, and the two mile, although on occasion I also ran longer distances and I ran in mixed medley races. In each race, I had the specific predetermined course that I had to run. It was exactly a certain length. It had to be run at the top speed that I was capable of for that particular distance. Now, I could run a 440, a whole lot faster than I could maintain that speed for a mile. But it had to be the top speed for that distance, the course determined in advance. It had to be run with consistency. It had to be run with endurance. It had to be run with wisdom to pace myself and not be psyched out by other runners sent in by other coaches to be rabbits to wear me out. And coaches do that kind of thing. They'll put one guy in the race they know can't really even finish the race, but they put him in to sprint at the beginning so that the good runners think they've got to keep up with him, and then they get worn out while his own teammates keep their pace and pass the tired runners near the end of the race. I had to make sure that at the beginning of the race I was running steadily to be ready at the precise moment to give the final kick into the finish line, to lunge at the precise moment when crossing the finish line, to hit the tape before the runners who were right on my heels. 
I ran some incredibly close races where I thought I was going to die. But I had a coach who had coached me in the way to run the race. And by the grace of God, won them. I had to fulfill my course, not somebody else's course. I had a specific race for which I'd been trained by my coach. I had to follow his directions exactly. And on one occasion, <coughs> the final race of my senior year in track, my coach gave me a command. In the last eighth of a mile of the race, the last 220 yards, coming out of the final turn, going toward the finish line, my coach told me to drop back and let the junior who would be taking my place the following year win the race. And I'd learned to obey the coach. So I did. And a boy named Mike, I stepped aside so that he could pass me and I came in one stride behind him at the finish line. You run the race that the coach gives to you, even if it is personal disappointment. That was the final race of my senior year of high school. Oh, how I would have loved to go out with a blaze of glory and win that final race. But the coach was preparing a man to take my place the following year. Remember, we have a coach who is preparing in each of our lives what comes next. An important lesson to learn. I learned it through some very difficult races, burning lungs, aching legs, cheating teams jumping in from the side in the middle of the race in the woods, people trying to spike me. That is, we had spikes on our shoes and they tried to get their shoe into the back of my calf as I was running. The races aren't always fair. Other coaches are not always fair. Other runners will push and shove. Other runners will try to box you in so that their teammates can get ahead. Your job is to run your course according to the instructions of your, of your coach. I had to run my course. A course determined by the coach, the race in which he decided to put me after studying the other teams, looking at the time trials of the other runners, determining if there was a race he thought I could win based on my time trials, and putting another slower man into what was perhaps my favorite race, because he knew that the competitor in that race was much weaker. You all know that in sports events there is a warm-up game with a group of second-string teams of individuals, so that that leads up to the big crowd pleaser, the crowd preparing for the big event. That's what we have with John. John fulfilled his course, and his course was to be the forerunner for the Messiah. If he had been earlier in the Old Testament, he would have been ranked with Moses and Elijah. Jesus says so. But because he ran the preparatory race before Jesus, he is totally overshadowed. Did he gripe about it? No. Did he wish he'd been someplace else in history? No. He knew his precise race to run, and he ran it precisely like the coach had told him to run it. He was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, according to Jesus, and yet he was less than those in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 11, 11, Jesus speaking. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Moses was born of a woman. Elijah was born of a woman. Isaiah was born of a woman. All of those who went before, all of them were born of a woman. Notwithstanding, listen to the last half of verse 11. 
notwithstanding that he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You have no idea how awesome it is to be in our time. We have so much that John did not have. He could only look forward to the work of Christ. We look back on the finished work of Calvary and the resurrection. He saw the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus in the form of a dove, but we have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit living inside of us. He only brought a message of repentance to Israel. We have the eternal gospel of salvation to carry. He was part of the Old Testament saints, friends of the bridegroom. We are the heavenly bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We have eternal blessings and rewards promised to believers in our age that were never promised to believers in the Old Testament. He was a descendant of Aaron and of the priestly tribe by both parents. But the New Testament tells us that we are a kingdom of priests. He was of the nation Israel. We are an international innumerable body, according to Revelation. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And you know, that's in spite of the fact that John was specifically prophesied in the Old Testament, very clearly so, in at least two major passages of Scripture. The first is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Boy, that is a powerful text if we had time to expound it tonight. He was making way for Jesus. It says, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That tells you something about Jesus. Because that's the verse that's specifically quoted in the New Testament as referring to John the Baptist. He was preparing for the Messiah. The Old Testament says that means preparing the way for God. Malachi chapter 3, in verse 1 it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. God is speaking to Malachi. He's talking about John the Baptist. He's talking about a messenger who's going to prepare the way. And God says he's going to prepare the way before me. Which member of the Godhead do you think was speaking at that moment? The written word of the Lord being spoken by the living word of the Lord. Prophesying John the Baptist's arrival, he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. The one who fulfills all the covenants. The one that the true believers in the Old Testament delighted in. They looked for this. John, the apostle, makes reference to these passages over in the Gospel of John in the first chapter. In verse 11, a verse that you know, it talks about the Incarnation. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, the very next verse. And John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now listen, John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus in his human body. But John, referring to Jesus, says, He was before me. The Gospel of John reminds us of that in John chapter 8, where Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees. And he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus responded, Before Abraham was... I am. Ego emi. 
Abraham, 2000 B.C. Moses at the burning bush, 1400 B.C. Before Abraham was, I am. Was Jesus before John? Though God sent John as the forerunner, born six months earlier. Yes, John understood it. John knew it. John preached it. He that cometh after me is preferred before me because he was before me. Down to verse 19. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Paul's making reference to these statements of John as he speaks to the Jews and the Levites from Jerusalem who came out to ask John who he was. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? That's refer reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And here he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3, which we've just read. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? <laughs> they didn't understand the baptism of repentance. He hadn't come into Jerusalem to preach. He was in the wilderness. An exodus of people was taking place out to the wilderness. Word got back what John was doing. And so they sent an investigation committee to check him out. He's getting big crowds. A lot of people are coming out to him. And the pharaohs that sat in the Sanhedrin didn't like what they heard. He said, it is he it is, excuse me, verse 26, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not, he it is, and here again is a verse that Paul is quoting. Who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. John had a powerful message. Paul reminds them of some of the key elements of John's message as recorded for us in the Gospels, word for word. To whom did John point? Verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Jesus and John were cousins. Isn't it interesting? John began to preach his message, the message of repentance, not knowing that Jesus was the one until the point of Jesus' baptism. He said, I didn't know it, but the one who told me to baptize told me, this is the one. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And we can see John's humility in the next verse, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. He took those two disciples and sent them after Jesus. He didn't try to hold on to them for himself. He sent them after Jesus. When he knew who Jesus was, he pointed others 
to him. He didn't try to hold on to it for himself. He pointed others to Jesus. And that's the point Paul's making over in the book of Acts. For John, fulfilling his course also meant death. Fulfilling his course meant death at the hands of an evil man, Herod, an evil woman, Herodias, an evil teenage girl, Salome. John, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, and yet less than the least in the kingdom of heaven. Are you saved? That means that God in his sovereign grace has given to you that which is greater than John the Baptist ever had. John fulfilled his course. What are you doing with the course that God has set you to fulfill? John was victorious. His time of testing ended in victory, though human death ultimately glory. When you come to the end of your test, will there be victory? Or will there be defeat? That is, from God's grading scale. David knew and fulfilled his course. Look what it meant. Acts chapter 13, verse 36. A few verses from where we are right now. We find this statement. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. David fulfilled his course. What, he had, what had he done? He served his own generation by the will of God. You know, God has given to each and every one of us a specific course, a specific time in history, a specific race, specific training for that race. He's given us a job to do. Now we ask ourselves the question, David fulfilled his course, John the Baptist fulfilled his course. When you stand before your coach someday and he's giving you instructions about the race you're supposed to be running, the race of life, some shorter than others, some long, long distance races and some sprints. Children and young people die too. They have a very short race. But some of us have very long races. As you get to the end of your race, will you have followed the coach's directions? Will you have studied it so you know the coach's directions? You know he walks with you and gives you understanding. Many times my coach, when we would come to a new course, one that our team had never run, he would bring the team there early and he would walk over the course with us. He would point out dangerous areas of the course, narrow trails on the course where you had to make sure you were not back at the back of the line. Some of the races I ran had 600 people in the races, many, many, many teams from all over the East Coast. Van Cortlandt Park, New York City. And there were places on Van Cortlandt Park which were hazards. We had to run a huge long line, double deep, all focused in about a half a mile down to a narrow opening in the woods. We were running past ball diamonds and football games that were take-up games by other people playing out on that field. We had to get into the hills. We had to make sure we weren't stuck or boxed in. There were places which were very rocky and slippery, places where there was gravel. The last quarter mile was sand. And our coach would walk us over the new courses and he'd show us the things that were on the course 
and then tell us exactly how we were supposed to run when we got to those particular areas. You know, God has done that with you. He has given you a complete guideline of how to run your course. There are different types of ground in life. Different areas of the course where there is very bad danger. Other areas where you will be slowed down if you don't know what you're doing. Do you know the coach's instructions? When you give account to the coach, when you cross the finish line, when you make that final plunge to beat the enemy, will he say, well done? You ran the race that I planned for you to run, and you ran it well. Paul says, I have finished the fight. I've run my course. I've finished the fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me, and not unto me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. Fought the fight. Finished the course. Run the race. Cross the finish line. What will you say when it's your turn to fulfill your course? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are warned once again and reminded once again of our responsibility, but it's a responsibility coupled with power. Not our power, but the power of the Spirit of God. We're reminded of our responsibility, but not something that we have to guess at. It is laid out for us in the Word of God. You have given us a course to run. You've given us a time in history. You've given us a beginning point. You've given us an ending point. Some races are short. Some races are long. But you've told us specifically how we are to fulfill our course. Not somebody else's course. Our course. How we are to serve our generation before we fall on sleep so that we might like David receive your commendation and your blessing make us men and women who are serious about our business not like athletes who party the night before the race or get drunk the night before the race or carouse the night before the race or those who show up late for the race or those who putter in the race and look at the flowers but those who are determined to win the race. Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. Help us each to fulfill his or her course. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight.